Sue and I have been coping with the effects of a chronic progressive disease for over six years now. We would like to share with you some of the practical strategies that we have been taught, that we have discovered, and we have invented, so that some of them may help you in your situation. Or perhaps, by seeing how we problem solve, you will be empowered. Now, we don't have all the answers, and so if you have some uh, thoughts as to how you could help us, please write to us at the address that you'll find at the end of this video. In this presentation, we are not endorsing or promoting any specific equipment or product. We are not being paid by any company to advertise. We are going to be talking about the activities of daily living, including personal care, some pretty down-to-earth stuff, but we'll try to be discreet. We will not be dealing with the emotional issues of living with chronic illness or quality of life issues, as these were topics covered in our two previous videos. Topics that will be covered include mobility, dressing, feeding, skin, mouth, and general health care, communication, as well as activities, and taking a vacation. So come, share our life with us for a while. As Sue's mobility and balance deteriorated, she first needed a cane, and then a rollator. The wheelchair soon followed. So the porch lift was the first major addition along with a wooden platform to get rid of the step at the front door. Modern screen doors automatically close if hit, and so we had to devise a way to hold it open for the wheelchair to pass through. In winter, to prevent the icing over of the control switches for the porch lift, I place plastic bags over the control boxes. The bags are secured by rubber bands. When Sue could no longer do pivot transfers, we installed a battery-operated lifting system. The blue fabric sling is soft and it lifts Sue gently. The batteries are recharged about once a week overnight. Tracks on the ceiling allow for the lift's lateral movement. We have three locations for the tracks. The lifts get transported between them. One is in the bathroom. This means that Sue can be lowered into the bathtub where she reclines on a bath chair. The third lifting location is in the living room where Sue can spend time resting on the sofa. We also have a lift in the car. Originally, we got Sue into the car by sliding her across a transfer board. But once she lost all body movement, we needed a battery-operated lift. And it runs off the car battery and can be kept in the trunk of the car when not needed. We used to have a wheelchair rack at the back of the car, but I never felt it was a safe way of transporting the chair. So now we put the chair in the back seat of the car. Chronic progressive diseases start out with smaller difficulties. At first, Sue just needed elastic shoelaces and a long-handled shoehorn. Zippered pants were replaced by ones with elasticated waists. But once she needed to be dressed by others, the size of the clothes was increased. Sue must be rolled to pull her pants up. The larger the pants, the fewer maneuvers are needed. When moving a helpless person, caregivers must look after their own bodies, especially their back. The height of the bed can make a difference. Bed blocks can be used to raise a bed. Sue's arms are spastic and pressed tight against her chest. She must be stretched in order to get the sleeves on. Her left arm is worse, and so it must be dressed first. The larger the shirt, 
the easier it is. Dressing when Sue is sitting up in the chair is less of a strain on both of us. Some types of clothing are much easier to use. For example, nightgowns having an opening down the back. And slippers stay on better if they come up around the ankles. Since Sue's hands tend to form fists, we use mittens rather than gloves. In cooler weather, two shawls partially joined can quickly give added warmth and be removed easily. If Sue is out in the wind, she always wears sunglasses, whether the sun is out or not. She doesn't blink as often as she should, and she can't tell me that she's got dust in her eye. So we try to anticipate problems before they happen. Even so, Sue does get eye infections. If we go out in the rain, Sue wears a rubberized poncho, which covers everything on top, and her legs are protected by a garbage bag. Sue stays dry. I'm left to fend for myself. As strength waned, self-feeding and drinking became difficult. Beakers with lids and straws were used. When you can't tilt your head back, a nosy cup can be used. As Sue began choking on liquids, they were thickened for safer swallowing. Pills were taken on a spoon of applesauce. It is essential to get the advice of a speech pathologist regarding swallowing problems. The warning signs are choking, coughing, drooling, and the pocketing of food in the cheek. When precautions are not taken, it's not just the risk of choking that increases, but also the risk of chest infections. Sue's food had to be pureed, and caregiver feeding was necessary. Only a teaspoon should be used, and the food on it always identified. The feeder should sit and wait to see swallowing before giving the next mouthful. Different pureed foods should not be mixed together, as the individual taste is an important experience. Sue likes to know what she is eating. But Sue wasn't eating enough, and she got very thin. So the time had come for the gastric tube. Oh, what joy! Sue put on weight and became fully hydrated. We add water to the prepared cans of balanced nutrition and fiber. We still use pureed food and freeze it in ice cube trays, for Sue still needs to taste food. She chooses each day what she wants to taste, and it's warmed in the microwave. It is put in her mouth, but she does not swallow it. A paper towel is placed under her chin, and the food is allowed to drop out. As well as meats and vegetables, Sue experiences baby food fruits, chocolate puddings, yogurt, and ice cream. This is not done for nutrition, but purely for the taste experience. She knows the risk if what she takes is swallowed. Sometimes, Liquids are washed over Sue's tongue by a foam-tipped stick, juices, a touch of beer, and a taste of red wine has been known to cross her tongue via a syringe. The leftover pureed food is put in the blender with prune juice, which acts as a laxative, and some natural yogurt to limit yeast infections. Sue tends to get yeast infections after she's been on antibiotics. This blended combination is syringed into Sue's gastric tube. 
I feel better that she's still digesting real food in conjunction with the premixed cans. The gastric tube is cleaned out with cranberry juice, which we also hope cuts down on her bladder infections. We sometimes have to use the calorie-reduced commercial variety, but generally try to find real cranberries and make our own juice with no added sugar. For hygiene, we put the finger of a latex glove over the end of the gastric tube, and this is held in place with a rubber band. Sue's medication is now crushed in a pill crusher and suspended in water and syringed into the tube. We found taking tincture of echinacea at the hint of a cold seems to help. We've also tried the herb golden seal. And when Sue has been on antibiotics, we supplement Sue's yogurt intake with capsules of lactobacillus acidophilus. This is especially important if diarrhea is a side effect of the antibiotic. The results are miraculous. Having the gastric tube for feeding has given us such freedom. In the house, we use an IV pole to hold the gravity bag. But when we're out, we use an extending photographic monopod secured to the back of the chair. The old wheelchair allowed the pole to drop down the back. We've had to add a clamp to the new chair for the pole to fit into. If we're in a hurry or it's too cold to picnic outside, the gravity bag can be put up in the car. And if it's flowing too slowly, it can be raised using the frame of the car lift. Hair washing can either be done when Sue is in the bathtub or in bed. She's quite round-shouldered and so can't get her head right back into the shampooing bowl. But if we don't inflate the top ring of the bowl too much and use plenty of towels and plastic to redirect the water, the job is successful and the bed stays dry. When we're away from home or in a hurry, we use a shampoo that does not have to be washed off. The hair is just toweled. Sue is prone to dry scalp, and using this shampoo ongoing tends to aggravate the condition, so we only use it when we really have no other choice. Skin care gets a great deal of attention. Maintenance of skin integrity is of primary importance, but time for a facial must be found. Reddening in the groin area is often caused by a fungal infection, and that can be treated with a prescription cream. Massage to the buttocks is essential to maintain good circulation, and we rub in zinc oxide cream to protect the skin from dampness. Petroleum jelly is also used. 
unscented talcum powder and cornstarch also promote dryness. An iodine solution will also cleanse and dry the skin. An egg crate mattress reduces pressure problems while in bed. Sheepskin, real or artificial, also help to reduce pressure points. If Sue does get a wound, we may choose to cover it with a stick-on gel-based dressing. When we want to draw out infection from a wound, or from under the toenails, the area is soaked in salt water, either regular salt or Epsom salts. We try to ensure Sue has her bowel movements while suspended in the lift over the bed. This keeps her skin drier, and it is easier to clean up. Sue has an indwelling catheter, and so diapers are worn purely in case of accidents. So I cut away the gathered elastic in the groin area to allow more air to circulate. If acidic substances are irritating the skin, either on the buttocks or around the opening for Sue's gastric tube, we soothe the skin with an antacid, such as milk of magnesia. Occasionally, the milk of magnesia is used to promote a bowel movement, but Sue's diet has fiber in it. She drinks plenty of liquid and has four ounces of prune juice a day, and all that seems to keep her regular. Spasticity has made for tight clamping of Sue's jaw in the past, and most of her front teeth have snapped off. Also because of the spasticity, cavities and extractions have had to be attended to under general anesthetic, and that's something we'd prefer to stay away from now. So mouth care is something we take very seriously, at least twice a day. The foam on a stick that we use is impregnated with toothpaste, and Sue likes to chew on it. After all, when fed by a gastric tube, chewing is something you miss. We use a fluoride rinse to ward off cavities, and twice a day Sue's mouth is rinsed with a prescription antiseptic. It is important to reduce oral infections because when saliva is aspirated, it will lead to chest infections. Sue aspirates her saliva. This leads to increased lung secretions and the risk of infections. So we try to keep Sue's head positioned, allowing the saliva to drip out rather than be swallowed. Sue's bibs have gone through quite an evolution, from tea towels with ties on, to one sewn to a triangular scarf. Then towels backed with old tablecloths enclosing a cut-up shower curtain to make it waterproof. Alas, the heat from the tumbler dryer saw the destruction of that venture. But now, we have entered a new era. The age of water-resistant material is used by outdoor enthusiasts. And that's what backs our toweling now. We have tried medications which have the side effect of drying the mouth, so cutting down on the saliva. However, there is a balance here. If we dry up the saliva, the lung secretions will become thicker and less easy to cough up, and we want those secretions up and out. We didn't want a hospital bed in the house, but we're lucky enough to find a second-hand commercially produced bed which elevates. Especially at night, a suction pump is needed to remove the sputum from the back of Sue's throat. To keep those secretions on the move, we do clapping. The palms are cupped so that it is the air pressure against the chest wall which causes the vibrations. It is less effective when done over the bones of the shoulder blades. 
Sue's bed also vibrates, and when she rests on the sofa, we use a vibrating cushion, which is operated by rechargeable batteries. Positioning is important for Sue's comfort. Spastic arms must be stretched regularly and positioned with wedges to encourage expansion of the chest. Contractures are likely to develop, and so we have used splints to try to maintain a healthy position. And this one made by an occupational therapist can only counteract so much spasm. A ready-made one has helped, but tends to redden the skin over protruding bones, even when extra padding is used. A face cloth in the palm can extend the fingers. The wheelchair tray can help with the right hand. Although no longer spastic, Sue's legs must be taken through a passive range of movement regularly. The spasm in Sue's neck holds her head up for periods, but her neck does need support sometimes. This commercially bought neck brace has helped. It is taken off for feeding, but always put on when traveling. Another item of importance is the bag at the back of the wheelchair. Always it contains a supply of bibs and a bag for the wet ones, the monopod for feeding, in case of emergency, there's an extra urine bag, feeding bag, syringe, and a garbage bag to protect Sue's legs from the rain, just in case. Bags with many compartments make it easier to find things, cosmetics, comb, sunscreen, sunglasses, and an album of photographs, so words are not needed to describe Sue's life when she meets people. Sue wants to project an image of having interests and living her life to the full. Then there's Sue's wallet. In it, health cards and hospital cards, everything Sue might need in an emergency, including a piece of paper on which details medical condition, information on feeding, medications, and phone numbers. And also these words. Despite her disabled state, Sue values life and does not want it to end. Please take all measures to enable her to continue to enjoy what she has. In a busy emergency department, who knows how attention would be prioritized. Many find trying to communicate with someone who cannot speak intimidating it brings out feelings of inadequacy in others. Sue communicates by head and eye movements. She can express herself with yes or no responses if the right questions are posed. But it's no good asking, how are you today? Because she has no way of responding. But if you say, are you feeling okay? She has the choice of yes or no. If she was to indicate no, then one could investigate. Are you in pain? Are you feeling sick? Are you too hot? Are you feeling unhappy? Sue loves to have the world around her described to her. She is visually impaired and so does not see it clearly, but she can use her other senses to experience her environment. Sue, when you're with somebody and they've run out of things to say, are you glad that they just stay, that they just touch you, that really words aren't important, it's just them being there that's important? Yeah? We seem to think that it is the words that are craved when really it is togetherness and connectedness that is wanted. Sue likes to be read to from books or the newspaper. She plays the talking books. 
She listens in to telephone conversations. We have two phones hooked to the same line. She responds to questions, and I relay her answer. Her phone has an amplifier in the mouthpiece, for in the days when she still spoke but softly, others could hear. Sue likes being part of the action. She goes to baseball games, even though she can't see the ball. But she can smell the popcorn, hear the crowd, and feel the excitement. She listens to the commentary on the radio, and she uses her imagination. Being there is to experience life and so be part of its reality. She can still hear the world around her clearly. Our garden is a special place for us to escape the world, and I love sharing it with Sue. The grass is difficult to push a chair across, so patio stones make a ramp for our slope. Sue is often a passive participant, but not always. She has made silk screen scarves at her day program to give away as gifts. She sponge paints her Christmas letter, which I have printed each one a unique creation. Our Christmas card is a picture of us, usually in the outdoor environment, but always conveying the message that Sue wants others to realize she is living. Going away for the weekend or on holiday is a cherished activity. Taking a portable hydraulic lift with us means that Sue can be transferred from bed to chair. We just have to ensure that the bed is high enough off the floor for the lift to pass under. We rent the lift, but we have our own split leg sling, which is necessary for personal care. We don't like the chains or the hard canvas. When we were away last year, we found that by altering the lengths of the straps, with practice, we could use our own home lifting sling instead. We take with us the suction pump, the battery recharger for the vibrating cushion, and the pump for the wheelchair tires. Also, plastic garbage bags to put over the mattress in case of accidents. Sue's catheter draining bag is hidden within a fabric bag, and the tubing is also disguised. When on holiday, the toilet does not have to be in reach, but it does make life easier. At resorts, patio doors often have a raised edge. I take some wooden blocks in case they're needed. Although Sue cannot propel her wheelchair, we still have one which has large wheels at the back for easier tipping. An added bonus for us is when recreational facilities are accessible. This enables Sue to share my activities and she knows I'm close by. Having Sue out in the sun must be monitored. She can't tell me if she's burning or uncomfortable. So we routinely use sunscreen cream, sunglasses, hats, and as much shade as possible. If we can't guarantee the shade, I would put a long-sleeved shirt on Sue. Another favorite destination for us is a friend's trailer overlooking a lake.
but we've needed to take the rims off the wheels to get the wheelchair through the screen door. Again, the traveling hydraulic lift completes the transfer between chair and sofa bed. Sue and I can't make it on our own. We are dependent on friends and volunteers on a regular basis. Sue is never alone. Professional health care workers are needed so that I can go out to work and take respite. Respite is not a luxury. It is necessary for all caregivers. With this kind of support, we can succeed. Not all are so fortunate. Sue's love of life makes the role I play so rewarding. But this journey is definitely not for everyone. Not all people are cut out for it. There is no shame in accepting institutional care. Indeed, when all the personal care needs can be met within the institution, it affords the family caregiver more energy to share quality time with their loved one. A year has passed since we started making this video. We do not know the end of the story. All we know is that so far we have been blessed with more successes than failures that the scary times and the depressing times have been far outweighed by the joyful and exciting times. No problem has yet been insurmountable, and we will wait till tomorrow to face that day's challenges. Oh.